Hello, I'm Kate Campbell Stevenson. My guest today is Sally Patterson, and she's with the board of the Sewell Belmont House Museum. Welcome, Sally. Thank you. It's good to be here. What an exciting event with the Alice Awards that we had here yes. today. You want to tell us a little bit about from your perspective? The Alice Award is in its 11th year. It's a, a ceremony that we do each year in, in September to honor women who have provided leadership in the continuing fight for women's equality. And today we honored by Kirsten Gildebrand from New York. It was a room full of very, very dynamic women. They had some wonderful comments. Can you share with me what was an impact for you? What excites me most about this luncheon is that we get young women who come who are clearly the next ground of uh, women professionals in Washington, D.C., and that the fight for equality continues with, with new women who are very excited about their prospects for becoming leaders uh, in, um, in Washington and in their organizations. The women that we had awarded today was Kirsten Gillibrand, some real leaders in the Senate. Yes. Wonderful role models for those young women that were here today. And talking about the role models that had actually influenced their careers and gotten them started early on. Yes. And um, I think the, the underlying theme of part of the conversation was all about how women are collaborators and how women support women. And it's always fun to be in a room and to feel that kind of energy and that kind of positive um, reinforcement about the need for us to continue to do this work together. Stevenson, and joining me today is Jamie Steen, who is a former reporter with the Washington, uh, excuse me, the Baltimore Sun, and she also has her own newspaper column, syndicated column. Welcome. Thank you so much. Tell me about your column. I write on history, politics, and culture, and how they connect. And today we're at the capital of women's suffrage. We're not so far from the capital of the United States. How did you enjoy the event? I, I couldn't be happier. I love this time of year, this kind of energy in the room, w women um, kind of reinforcing each other and building bridges, and also remembering and honoring the women who gave us the vote. And that wasn't so long ago. It was in 1920. Any woman walking around in the United States should know that fact. How hard we had to fight and how long we had to fight. Indeed. What is it like to you to be with this room of so, so many powerful women? Well, I covered the Senate, so I'm familiar with the two senators, and I'm not overawed by them. I know that they both work very hard, and they're both very unpretentious people and very dedicated. Mm -hmm. So they don't have—they're not at all s snobbish, and you can feel the energy in this room is very positive. And wishing that there was more of that in the Capitol, in the Senate especially, today. These women today are excellent role models about working together to have a positive action. Senator Gillibrand said that women not only listen better, but they also bring different solutions to a table. And so the companies and states that elect women or have women on their board make unusual decisions or make, don't make it obvious you know, the usual suspects of, of decisions and policies. Like she mentioned uh, family medical leave, pay, and how much of a difference that would make to women, working women. Senator Gillibrand of New York has her nine-year-old son Theo with her today because he wasn't feeling well enough to go to school. Excellent role model and example about how we need to move forward, be more creative, and as women, speak up and demand the changes that we need. Which is what Nika said she did to get her fair salary. She wrote a book about it. Um, and I think she, she speaks to the fact that women are often too shy or not socialized to be advocates for themselves. Advocates for everybody else but themselves. And Alice Paul, who lived in this house and strategized and led protests and parades and vigils and got arrested and forced fed, Alice Paul was not afraid to ask. In fact, 
that she was going to to tell. Woodrow Wilson, who was the President of the United States 100 years ago, just what would be fair and just and long overdue for women, and that was the vote. I hear Alice Paul with the Swarthmore. Yes, I have a personal connection because she went to the Swarthmore College class of 1905. I came a little after that, but I still feel very connected. She's a spiritual heroine to me. And a Quaker. Thanks so much for being sharing some time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always such a treat to be at School Belmont House, brimming with history and sisterhood. I am um, happy to welcome other people from the cable industry. Time Warner Cable is here today. And Scripps Howard. So thank you for joining us. I um, am delighted to lead the way particularly representing our channel's lifetime and history. We're so proud to co-sponsor with Tupperware and to join you all in recognizing Senators Gillibrand, my senator, go New York. Um, this year, as Diane Lipsy, our wonderful chairman here, noted, um, History Channel donated the short documentary on the role of this historic house in the struggle for women's equal rights. The production of that video has been a true partnership with the dedicated staff that works here. So I just want to say, ladies, do you ever sleep? You are such a small staff and you seem to be everywhere. Every time I make a call, every time I email, you return it right away. Thank you so much. It is a lean machine that runs School Belmont House, and I know they appreciate everyone's support. At History, channel, we're, we're working on a new drama about Houdini. And let me tell you, that great performer had nothing on the magic that the staff at School Belmont produces every day. Currently, I'm in the middle of writing a book about food, and I'm having a great time with it. People get very bored sitting with me at dinner because I say, oh, bananas? Do you know where bananas came from? It's nonstop. Um, but I've learned a couple of things that I have sort of happened to help my understanding of life, and I will share with you today very briefly. It has one re re reawakened my awareness of how women's lives have continually intertwined with food in a boundless multitude of ways, from the back-breaking work in the fields to the never-ending meal prep and cleanup to menu planning at the White House provides a really intriguing window into that great and colorful chamber that we call women's history. And while you're eating, think about where this food came from, who prepared it for you, and all of the things that we can learn three times a day as we sit down to our meals. And for those of you who are snackers like I am, that means four times or five times a day. The second thing I've learned about writing and researching about food is that it makes you hungry. Never write about barbecue at 11 o'clock in the morning if there's no food around, or if you're at your office, you will end up eating that chocolate cake that you had been able to resist for hours earlier. Suddenly, foods you wouldn't consider eating sing a siren song, which has given me a new appreciation for timely meals. So the last thing I want to do is get between you and your lunch, or your dessert, even more importantly. I just want to say thank you and salute the people who make this possible. Cheers to the Board of Trustees here at School of Belmont, particularly their president, Diane Lipsley, who I've enjoyed getting to know over all these years. I want to point out some people who have joined us, the, uh, representing the National Endowment for the Humanities, Carol Watson. We have representatives from the IMLS. Thank you so much. That's the Institute of Museum and Library Services. They're very important people here at a museum like School of Belmont. Kathy Gorn, who runs National History Day, Gary Atremba from the Library of Congress. These are the wonderful institutions in, in Washington, D.C. that support the study of history and the humanities. So thank you, ladies, for joining us here on this important day at School of Belmont. We know that you're committed to these stories as well. Senator, thank you for the thoughtful remarks. Kirsten Gillibrand was first sworn into the U United States Senate from the state of New York in 2009. 
She has led the fight to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and fought to provide health care and compensation to first responders and community survivors at Ground Zero. She's also started a campaign called Off the Sidelines to help recruit and support women candidates at the local, state, and federal levels. This fall, she will introduce a package of economic reforms to ensure that the American women can compete on an equal footing in this economic environment. Please welcome Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Well, it is such a delight to be here. Um, I agreed with everything Susan said. <laughs> there wasn't one story she told that I didn't smile and giggle and say, that's happened to me. Um, but she made all the points that I want to make, so I just want to continue on where she left off. She is very right that there is a unique skill, a unique gift that women bring to the table in leadership. And that is why I am so honored to receive this award today. Because we truly stand on the shoulders of so many other women who fought battles before us, from Alice Paul on, women who believed that women had a right to vote, had a right to be heard, a right to be part of these national conversations. And it is a battle that was started more than 100 years ago, and one, frankly, that we are still fighting today. What I loved about what Susan said is what women do bring to the table. It's not that we all have the same ideas. It's not that we all agree on everything. But what we do do is we listen. We find common ground. We build consensus. We find where we agree, and then we go from there. And that's something that Susan has been so kind enough to do with me since I entered the Senate. One of the first times I went and met with Susan was uh, when I was beginning to work on the Don't Ask, Don't Tell issue. And I went to her office and we talked about what it was like to serve in the Senate. She gave me lots of good life advice about things that work, things that don't work. And then we began to talk about this issue of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And she shared my view that men and women who are offering so much of themselves, giving of themselves in every way, even their lives, should not have to hide who they are and who they love. And we agreed that that was something where we shared common ground and we work on over the next two years. Well, at the end of the day, it was because of Susan Collins that we passed that repeal. She delivered the seven Republicans that were necessary. I had to work on my undecided Democrats, which took a while. But she managed to get the crucial votes at the end of the day. She also helped me when we took on a common sense reform like members of Congress shouldn't engage in insider trading. Um, something you can imagine should be a law, but wasn't. So again, Susan and I partnered to get that done in very short order. And today, Susan and I are fighting probably one of the toughest battles we've ever fought. We're actually taking on the entire Department of Defense. <laughs> Every general that exists in our military today disagrees with Susan and I. But we are standing shoulder to shoulder with the men and women who are serving in our military. And this is a grave challenge of sexual assault in the military. And the reason why Susan and I feel so passionate about this issue is because we listen to the victims. We actually listen to what they tell us is going on within the military. When we find out that there's 26,000 unwanted sexual contacts, assaults, and rapes a year, but only 3,300 are actually coming forward, there's a huge problem. That's 23,000 cases where that victim feels she cannot get justice in the current system. And so we ask them, why did you not report the crime? And the men and women who have been victimized say over and over again, we don't trust the chain of command. We don't trust they will do anything. And we've seen too much retaliation. We are afraid that if we report, our careers are over and we will be punished. And that's exactly what happened. So those 3,300 victims who did report their cases, 62% were retaliated against. And so that's what we're up against. We are trying to create an objective system, one where a trained military prosecutor actually looks at these cases, not their commanders, so that they can actually have a chance of objective justice, not someone who will be reviewed on whether or not these crimes happened under the watch, someone who may not know the victim or the perpetrator. And even as General Dempsey said, he said, I can imagine we've gone soft in the past on people who are actually more highly decorated, may have a Purple Heart or two or several tours of duty. 
and we may not believe the victim in those cases. That is the kind of issue that we have to combat. And we have to combat it because these are our best and brightest. Imagine it's your son or your daughter who is so brutalized within his own command and then not protected and no one's had their back. So I think that's one of the differences that women can often bring to public life. That ability to listen, that ability to find a solution, to bring people together around it and find the common ground. We find the same success in business. Interestingly, we only have 3% women on corporate boards of Fortune 500 companies, and we only have 16% of women on these boards. But if you even have one woman on a corporate board, that company is 40 times less likely to have to restate their earnings. Now, you can imagine what that means. <laughs> They're basically doing their job well. Um, but it's also true that returns on investment are higher, returns on equity are higher for those companies that do have diversity, do have women on their boards. So it is best for America when women's voices are heard, whether it's in the public sector or in the private sector, when women have a meaningful role in debates, not only are different issues being raised, but different solutions are being offered. We still have enormous challenges to go. The work that Alice Paul started long ago has not yet begun. Even she said so, so presciently then, she said, it's incredible to me that any woman should consider the fight for full equality won. It has just begun. And it is very far from being won. Even if we look at simple things like equal pay, which Mika has spent so much time researching and developing a very cogent narrative, Women are being paid 77 cents on the dollar. If you're an African-American woman or a Latina, it's even less. If you just paid a dollar on the dollar for equal work by men and women, you could raise the United States GDP by up to 9%. What an economic engine. And we know from women in small businesses that women-owned small businesses are among the fastest growing sectors within small businesses. So truly, if you just give women's place in the economy that they deserve and give them the opportunities that they need, you could create enormous economic growth. But there are challenges, and they are real challenges. Issues like affordable daycare. Little, little Theo's here today with me, my nine-year-old, because he's sick. Now, I get he's not that sick. Mostly allergies. Don't worry, you're not going to get any illness. You can see his eyes are very puffy. Um, but I at least have the flexibility that I could bring my child with me to work. How many working mothers cannot do that? Most. Most, if you asked to bring a child to work, you would be fired. So that woman would have to take the day off. If their employer doesn't care about that particular employee, she would get fired. That is the biggest challenge for working mothers today, having affordable, safe places for their children before they enter kindergarten. Now, kindergarten starts at five. So a lot of these working mothers worry, is my child getting access to good early childhood education? In most cases, the answer is no. And so those children are being left farther and farther behind. And on the day they start kindergarten, they may not know their letters. They may not know their numbers. They may not have had a home environment where books were read to them every night. And so why aren't we fighting for universal pre-K? We should be. Every child in this country should have the opportunity to reach his or her God-given potential. And why aren't we worried about women in the workforce who are still 70% responsible for all the child care, all the family care, all the housework? So when you're having an infant, why don't we have uh, paid family medical leave, when you've adopted a baby, when your father or mother is ill and dying? Why don't we give employees that little bit of flexibility? The companies that do that, their returns are higher, they are more productive, their employees are more loyal, and they are more effective and efficient companies. That is the future of America, and those are the issues we should be fighting for. Something as simple as the minimum wage. Is it a woman's issue? Well, it actually may well be. 64% of minimum wage earners are women. Women, and many of them are women with children. And do you know what the minimum wage actually is? It's $15,000. That is $3,000 below the poverty line if you have two kids. So what we're actually telling these women, I want you to work 40 hours a week, and I want you still to be in poverty, and I want your children to go to bed hungry, because we are no longer rewarding work in this country. That has to change. 
And that is the women's movement. That is part of the women's agenda that so many of us have a real stake in, a stake in really pushing forward in the future so that America can finally reach her economic potential, so that all of our companies can reach their potential, so we can have a growing economy again. Thank you so much for welcoming me, and it's a delight to be here. I'm here with Beth Harton. You were here and experienced this wonderful event today. Um, it was all about women's equality and women running for office. Uh, I heard you reacting a little bit to some of the statistics that were being talked about today. Can you remember some of those, uh, something that really stirred you? One of the things that so stunned me today were the statistics for unwanted sexual contact in the military. And I believe the st statistics were something like 63,000 unwanted sexual contacts in the previous year, only 3,000 of which were reported, and a small number of that prosecuted. And of that group, uh, many of the people were retaliated against. Is that correct? Cut. That sounds very I, much. Well, it sounds very much what okay. she said. So um, I found that really, really upsetting. Beth, I understand that your daughter was part of this event today. Can you explain a little bit? She was. Um, she is the manager of the collection and the institution here, and she helped bring this event together. I'm very, very proud of her. As you should be. As I should, <laughs> as I should be. My guest today is Elspeth Kirsch, and she's the collection manager. Collections and, and facilities manager. Excellent. And can, what can you tell us about what's going on here at the Sewell Belmont right now? I care for all of the objects within the house, all of the archival material, and I also care for the house itself. So what we've been involved in is this incredibly exciting preservation project. We have been working with the National Park Service. They've been fantastic partners as we repair this beautiful building. It was built in 1799, so there are some cracks in the plaster. And we have also been working with scholars and academics and people who are just generally interested in women's history to expand the discussion of both historical and contemporary women's issues. And one of the great pleasures and frankly privileges of my work here at Sewell Belmont is hearing how equality influences the people that come through this door. Because we have women that were part of the street protests in Cairo, Egypt. And we have United States Senators. And to know that they have stood in this house, the house where Alice Paul lived and worked for nearly five decades, it's, it's a confluence that doesn't exist anywhere else. women leaders working together, having that wonderful energy going forward. That's what the Sewell Belmont is very much about, and the Alice Awards, honoring Alice Paul, of course. Of course. A great woman leader. Yes, yes. Indefatigable, well into her 90s. She was still working for women's equality. She started, you know, uh, to work uh, for, for the right for women to vote in um, the, the 19 teens and um, then moved on um, after women got the right to vote with the 19th Amendment and continued to work on the Equal Rights Amendment clear through um, most of her life until she suffered a stroke um, towards the end of her life. She really was an incredible woman. What a great role model to try to make sure we all remember Alice Paul. Absolutely, and absolutely. And very smart. I mean, one of the things that's so exciting about the exhibits here in, in the the museum is that we actually have the cards that they use for tracking the votes of the various members of Congress. She was very, very politically astute and understood why making a difference in Washington was the key to achieving the vote for women. That was one of the most inspiring uh, mementos here in the museum that I first saw when I came in probably about 10 years ago was the lobbying cards and how they kept records. 
as we don't, they didn't have the computers back then with the instant messaging. It was so amazing to realize how the women banded together right. and, and through letters were able to organize a nation to pass the 19th Amendment. And they were right here on Capitol Hill. I mean, you can look out the window and see the Capitol. So you know they were over there in those offices as often as they could get through the door, which is an important part, again, of saying that we're not going away. We're here and, and we're determined. This year is the 100th anniversary of the March on the White House. And so earlier this year, we did a reenactment of that. But you know that political savvy led to you know being in the face of the president, being in the face of members of Congress, and saying women really have um, a right to have this vote. And to be visible. I think this is a wonderful, with the, with the Sewell Belmont House and Museum and Alice Paul and now with having our, our women senators to make sure that women are always visible, that we have been and always will be participating and determined to have our voices be heard. We've had a really nice relationship with the um, State Department and they have been bringing women from all around the world to come and, and be inspired by the work of Alice Paul. They had a really great relationship with the State Department that's been very exciting. They've had delegations of women from all across the world who have come to the Sewell Belmont House and been inspired by the tradition of Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. The fight for equality continues all across the globe and, and the Sewell Belmont House is really proud to be a part of that. Well, thank you so much. Is there any last words you might want to offer? Um, I encourage people to come to see the museum. There are such wonderful exhibits here, wonderful stories that are told, and I think it's something that continues to inspire women every day. On the corner of Constitution Avenue and 2nd Street Northeast, next to the U.S. Capitol, sits the Sewell Belmont House, home of the National Woman's Party. For more than 60 years, this house has been at the center of the American woman's rights movement, a destination where activists congregate to fight for political, economic, and social equality for women. The Sewell Belmont House has been an integral part of the history.